All right. Wow, this room uh, carries voice really well. Nice. All right, maybe I'll teach in this room next year. Okay, uh, welcome to whichever class this is, 365? Exactly. 466 light, let's say. Uh, no, okay, welcome to 365. Uh, Adam uh, can't make it, I said something about uh, he hates some class, some, some maybe this class. Went off uh, to these, so, no, he is, uh, somewhere uh, on the East Coast at a very important meeting. So, um, I'm here uh, today. Uh, you know, they gave you the, the backup professor. It's okay. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, crypto. All right, so last time we talked about crypto to begin with, and, and we started it on public key cryptography, am I right? This all sounds familiar, vaguely familiar. Any announcements since last time? No announcements. Awesome. Any announcements will be encrypted and distributed to you. <laughs> okay, so Adam talked about the key or the box, right? This is for everybody. Good. So the box represents public key cryptography, um, where you can basically create keys that can go one way on uh, the in the box, and this allows you to do all sorts of um, Interesting cryptographic primitive. So you have a public key and a secret key. That's called a secret instead of a private key because otherwise it'd be P and P, and that's very confusing. Um, and uh, you talked about various properties that public key crypto enables, um, such as uh, the ability to hide the content of encrypted messages, the ability to uh, kind of attest that an encrypted message or that a message is coming from you. Um, and it requires uh, this sort of asymmetry, hence asymmetric cryptography, uh, where you can uh, generate your public and private key easily. But if you distribute a public key, someone can't use that to recover your private key. Um, and of course, you know, your public keys are all uh, uh, public. So you went through all of this already, right? The encryption signing and so forth. So we're just gonna move on from there. You went through signing, non-repudiation. Say if you basically encrypt something with your private key so that it can be decrypted with a public key, then you're in, a, in essence saying, I, th I'm the only one that can make this encrypted uh, message. And you're basically saying, I made this encrypted message. Um, this is super important. This is what's, you know, uh, to, to look forward uh, a couple of slides and maybe one lecture. This is what understands, you know, when you go to uh, uh, whatever, your bank.com, there's that little lock message, one of the things uh, or lock icon, one of the things that that depends on is this property of being able to sign something. Um, and uh, you went through kind of the, the master combination of all of this um, uh, for how to encrypt, given this sort of uh, theoretical concept of a public key, you can, if Alice wants to talk to Bob, uh, Alice can encrypt something to Bob and, and so forth. And my under well, that sucks. My understanding is you stopped at this slide, which is uh, a really cool quote, quote that uh, Google, so unfortunately Adam uses uh, PowerPoint which causes, just, just causes issues. I don't know why he does it. No one uses PowerPoint. So now we're gonna open this up in open office. It's gonna look like shit. Cause I, I mean, we gotta see the quote. Presumably it's a very important quote. I read it, so I know what it says. Yeah. 
You should really fire this guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So let's scroll all the way down in this uh, brilliant program. Ah. Are you shitting me? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're gonna Google for that. <laughs> Let's see if there's like a quote from that. There's got to be a quote from this somewhere. On wiki quote? So you think that's how Adam got it? Like just for <laughs> quotes about cryptography. No, no, no. It's it's uh No man, A Adam is uh pretty serious about these things. All right, hold on. We can solve this problem. All right. I'm gonna put this up and I'm gonna pull this slide up on my phone, which hopefully will be less uh bad. That's your photography exercise. Yeah, it's one down the So, okay, here's the slide for class. Loading. All right, so this quote, as you can see, Uh, fast forward. Oh, brilliant. All right. So, I mean, you can see on my phone that it is a readable quote. So, this, this is a quote from 1874. Now, keep in mind, we have this uh, concept of asymmetric crypto. And for asymmetric crypto, we need uh, a way to generate public and private keys using a technique that you can very easily generate a public and a private key, and they're kind of bound together in some way. But given a public key, you can't recover the private key. So the quote is by William Stanley Jevons of WikiQuote fame. And it says the following From 1874, over 150 years ago. Is that okay? The same difficulty arises in many scientific processes. Given any two numbers, we may. By a simple and infallible process of taking their product, but it is quite another matter when a large number is given to determine its factors. Right? And then he goes blah, 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 blah and he says, uh, you know, uh, can the reader say what two numbers multiplied together will produce the number 8,660,460,799? Anybody? <laughs> It, it, it's a hard problem. Of course, if I say what numbers multiply together will produce the number 15, you can get that quickly. But it becomes much, 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 much harder very quickly as the number gets bigger. And uh, this was true in uh, 1874, uh, and it's still true today, which is kind of an embarrassment to you know, humanity. Because with all of our technology, we're launching spaceships and Teslas at Mars, but uh, we still can't factor extremely large numbers. Of course, we have the processing power now to factor 8 billion, whatever, but not an arbitrarily large number. Uh, an interesting thing, actually, uh, a counterpoint is William Stanley Jevons goes on to say, similarly, there's no direct process for discovering whether any number is prime or not, which is interesting because he thinks that it is equivalent to discovering the factors of a number, because a prime number, of course, has no uh, factors that aren't one in itself. But that's incorrect. Now, 150 years later, through extreme efforts of all of society, we can test whether a uh, number is prime or not. So the primality test 
exist, but factoring still doesn't. Uh, modulo quantum computer. So suddenly you have something that is very asymmetric, right? Of course, you can take two numbers, two very large numbers, multiply them together, and have a big uh, mess of a number very quickly, but going the other way is very hard, right? And now we can start thinking about asymmetric crypto. That's why this quote was here. That's why we spent a uh, depressing amount of time. But you can see it hasn't aged well. <laughs> <laughs> so back to this monstrosity. All right. So now the history of public key crypto. So we reached all the way back to 150 years ago. Right? We saw William Stanley, whatever, uh, talk about this. Of course, uh, between then and now, there have been a number of uh, advancements. Um, for one thing, in uh, 1976, Dickie and Hellman, it's a very punk rock name. Uh, and in fact, Dickie and Hellman published a paper together on how to uh, exchange keys, uh, uh, private and public keys. Um, and then this is known as Dippy Hellman Key Exchange. And I didn't take a crypto course in undergrad. Uh, so until like late graduate school, I thought Dippy Hellman was a person. But it turns out it's two people. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that next. And then in 1977, uh, three scientists with uh, names that abbreviate to R, S, and A created RSA. And it's uh, kind of a general purpose public key crypto system that in a big way underpins much of uh, modern cybersecurity. Uh, that's starting to, to go out of favor, but it's, it's a very big thing and you'll learn about that today. We'll mention that at the same time, of course, governments have uh, had an interest in creating and breaking crypto systems for a very long time. Much of uh, computing was uh, propelled uh, to rapid development because of uh, the need to break Enigma in World War II, for example. Um, and so, you know, crypto systems uh, have, uh, have been uh, in one way or another folks in government for a while. Uh, it's the same with uh, modern cryptography. Uh, the concept of public key crypto was explored in the classified realm just a little before it was explored on the classified realm. And something like RSA was created four years before the RSA paper was published, right? So there's always this sort of uh, um, parallel exploration for these sort of things and some other aspects of security as well. So talk about uh, Dippy Hellman Key Exchange. This is a uh, method for generating and exchanging uh, keys between two parties over a channel that may be observed, right? And it's uh, kind of inspired by uh, this concept of uh, uh, pain. You can, you can try to think of it in, in terms of pain. So Alice and Bob might want to come up with a common secret color of paint to paint the inside of their house, this separate houses, right? Because this was invented a long time ago. They'll be living separately. Um, they uh, start with yellow and they paint the outside of their houses yellow and they want to, from that, derive what to paint inside of their houses so that it matches, right? So Alice and Bob each suited a secret color that they just have in a can. And it doesn't really matter what the color is in this example. And they take the public yellow color, and they take their secret color, and they mix it together. Right? And then they mail it to each other. The assumption here is that unmixing paint is impossible. Right? So even if someone intercepts the paint, and, and you know, UPS has a, a thing stolen, or there's a you know evil UPS person that, that peeks into the paint bucket. It doesn't tell the uh, adversarial party 
which of course you probably know is usually named Eve because you have A, B, and then Eve is evil. Uh, and so you can, uh, hopefully no one here is named Eve because that would be depressing. You can also say Adam um, or Euclid, Eugene. Eugene, a lot of options. Anyways, so E intercept the paint. All they get is uh, some weird blue color. I also color blind, so this might be incorrect. And then and some orange like thing. Um, although it looks green on my screen. So anyway, uh, the point is they mail this thing to each other, and it doesn't matter. They can like you know mail it. They can uh, paint a billboard the color. They just publicly exchange these uh, keys. And uh, the interesting thing next is that they take a different secret color, they mix it together, and they end up in a, with a common paint color that is secret. So this part is a little bit mysterious. It doesn't work with paint, right? But it works with math. And so here's how it works. First. Alice and Bob agree to two numbers, a very large prime. In our case, this is 23, it's huge. But in reality, it's going to be a very, very large prime. You know, many, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, 20, 48 bits or whatever. And a generator. Uh, the generator number has some restrictions on it. Uh, a lot of crypto systems have this interesting property where throughout their life, Special cases of the crypto systems are broken. And so that means people say, okay, well, RSA, which we'll get to later, or the helmet is safe, as long as the generator is not something, is not two, is not, you know, a uh, square of an even number. So, it's like, you, you get these sort of uh, restrictions. I'm not saying those are valid for the helmet, but they tend to arise for crypto systems in general over time as mathematicians start poking holes. So for now, we just say, okay, any uh, prime and a generator, they grab uh, two of these you know, secret colors and Alice's is four and Bob's is three. And they send their generator to the power of their secret modulo a very large prime across to each other, right? And this is a, an operation that is very easy to compute using uh, modular exponentiation. And if it wasn't for this mod three, uh, mod 23, you have nine to the third, and you say, okay, nine to the third is, is whatever, 81 times nine. And it's very easy to take the cube root of that, right? You just do it on your calculator, cube root of, you know, nine to the third is nine. Without the modulo, it's all fun and games, but with the modulo, suddenly you're only going one way. Going backwards, is very, very, very hard. Um, and I will show you some math. I think this is probably a little, uh, A, we're going uh, kind of off script. Don't tell Adam. Hold on, all right, brilliant. Okay, let's zoom all the way out. We have a pen, they don't have paper. Thank you. Okay, so we have a prime and that prime is P. We have a generator and that prime is G and then we have you know these two numbers A and B. And 
And I might have gotten ahead of myself a little bit by saying that it is uh, impossible to reverse that, but here's how this generally works. So you have g to the a, and let's say you're just kind of uh, in normal math here. There's no modulo, no nothing. First of all, everyone's familiar with the concept of a modulo? Let me know if, if not, we can very quickly go into that, but you have G to the A, and then if you want to get G back, you raise it to the negative A, right? Very cool. Very easy. Now, if you have, uh, wait, is this true? Don't you mean one over A? I mean one over A, thank you. Or you can do g to the a times g to the negative a. But I mean one over a. Okay, so you raise g to the a to the one over a, and you get g back. Okay, in a modulo situation, All right, okay, another way of, of, of saying this is you have g to the a, you shouldn't have gone off script, <laughs> modulo p. All right, now we're in a modulo situation. And let's say you want to operate up in the modulo level, right? So operation on g, if you have you know, G modulo P plus, I don't know, let's say plus A or B modulo P. This all op uh, operates in a field that is modulo P. The numbers, the possible uh, numbers in this field are from zero to P, everything is good. We, we uh, know how to operate there. If you wanna start operating on this guy, so of course, let's say you have g to the a times g, right? Normally, this is g to the a plus one, right? Everyone agrees? All right. If you're in a modulo field, this is g to the a plus one, of course, modulo p, and that's fine. Or if you're in a field modulo uh, a large prime, but this, interestingly, is in its own field that is kind of induced by this modulo. And operations that happen here happen modulo the totion uh, of P and the totion of a prime is that number minus one. So the point is, math here operates in this modulo, math in this exponent operates under a different modulo. This makes it, not for Divi Hellman, but for RSA, so we jump a little uh, ahead, very difficult to go backwards, and I'll explain why once we get to RSA. Let's finish up Divi Hellman. So, Uh, Alice sends Bob this uh, g to the a mod p. Bob sends Alice g to the b mod p. And Alice computes the secret key by um, raising what Bob sent her with her secret. And Bob sends um, computes that same secret key by raising what Alice sent with his secret. And then they have a common secret key. And it works out, again, because we are under the modulo of this large prime. Cool? All right. 
let's go on to what is more in my field, which is, or not my field, but what I'm more experienced with, which is RSA. And then we'll talk about uh, what I just uh, told you about uh, in that context. So RSA works in a different way. Diffie-Hellman works to distribute keys or to, to come up with keys in a uh, distributed fashion between two parties. RSA says, okay, given a key, or RSA is, is the more basic version of public key crypto where you have a public key, a secret key, and you can uh, send keys, send messages to each other. Oh, so. the why are they even sending a private key to each other? Should you only keep that to yourself? No, no, no. The, the, the private key, Divi Helmet is a uh, key exchange mechanism where they together, Alice and Bob, come up with a symmetric key that they can then use. Oh, okay. Right? So, yeah, these are kind of private numbers that they only send along through these mathematical operations. But in that, what's important is this nine. It's the, the secret key that is their common secret that they paint the inside of the house with and then can asymmetrically encrypt data when they pass it back and forth. RSA is a little different. RSA is that kind of quintessential public key uh, cryptography where Bob can say, this is my public key. You can put it on a billboard, hang it on, on Bob's house, and then Alice can take that, use that to encrypt information and send it to Bob. So how does RSA work? RSA has two prime numbers, P and Q. They should both be large, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we compute N. And N is the product of P and Q. And so as William Stanley, whatever, said earlier, this is very easy to do. Multiplication is not hard. But once you have n, going back to p and q is not currently computationally feasible for large values of p and q that satisfy some safety properties without a uh, quantum computer. And we have some time, I'll talk about why um, uh, the quantum computer can kind of get to that point faster than a classical computer. So, given n, it's very hard to factor p and q. Um, and then we do this uh, step that is an encryption step, basically. We choose a value e, and e is our exponent. And e can be a lot of different values. I mean, uh, basically E has to be um, basically bigger than one, otherwise it's a no-op, of course. There are some other safety properties where if you have an E that is very small, certain attacks can uh, be carried out to recover your encrypted message. If you have an E that is um, extremely big, then uh, these operations are very slow. Um, generally speaking, people choose E to be uh, uh, 2 to the 16th plus 1 nowadays. Uh, but an E of 7 in certain situations is also fine and so forth. Uh, and then making this computation, doing a modular exponentiation of some message A to the E modulo n is very easy. Uh, rather, we have algorithms that do it. Um, however, given C, the result of the encryption, even if you know E and uh, even if you know N, which are both public, it's very hard to calculate A. Again, going one way is easy, going the other way is hard. Why is this? Back to the paper. We talked about operations here uh, being done in this uh, quotient of uh, P um, uh, field. So we have 
Let, let's, let's build this cast of characters. In RSA, we have A, which is gonna be your message. But of course, the most important things are our P and our Q. And then we have N, which is P times Q. And also serves as our modulo under which all operations take place. We have E, which is something, it's whatever number is our, our exponent. And we'll have one more thing, actually, let's get to through this slide and, uh, no, let's not. Let's do it on paper. All right, so encryption is A to the E mod N, right? Make sense? So let's say E was three. This is a very bad E, but we'll do it because it is reasonable. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have E be three. Uh, what are some uh, primes for P and Q? Somebody, 11, 11 and 17 will be our primes. What's uh, the product of that? I'm sorry, 187. Um, and what's the number we want to encrypt? 732. 732. Let's go with that actually, and we'll demonstrate a property of RSA. Okay, so everything's under this modulo N. Right, and our modulo n is 187. Yes? It has to be less than n because we can't really uh, represent that many numbers within the field that is the integer modulo n. Right? What happens if you're in modulo 10? Right, so let's pretend we're in mod 10. And we have the number nine. What is nine mod 10? Cool. What is, what if we try to represent the number 13? Yeah. Number 13 is really three. So what is 732 mod N? 171. Okay, 171. So let's do that instead. So it's 732 is here. Yeah. All right. So we have 171, and we're going to do that to the E mod N. Um, so what does this end up with? 171 to the third power mod N, right? What is uh, that? Someone with a calculator? 18. So 18 is our ciphertext. All right. So for a second, let's pretend that we weren't doing mod n. So just a to the e, 171 to the third. What is that? Five million two hundred eleven. Five million and then zero 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 two hundred eleven. Brilliant. So five uh, million two hundred dollars. All right. Now let's say okay. Enough. Enough encryption. No more encryption. Now we want to decrypt. How do we decrypt the thing on the right? Cube root. Cube root. In other words, we raise it to one third, as someone pointed out, not negative three. The one third. Can somebody calculate that out? 171, very bright. <laughs> so, 171, we decrypted it nice and easy, right? There, there, there's no real problem. And, and recall, we don't care if anyone knows these two things, right? So just by knowing E, and by we're ignoring that right now, so we, we, we figure out, you know, this one second one. And in fact, don't quote me on this, but probably we can even figure out an E, uh, whatever, you know, 
perfect square uh, one over some integer that works we can figure it out. You can choose E every time. E is more or less independent of N, right? Uh, but, but generally speaking, E is a well-known value. Like I said, there's certain values of E that are problematic, very small ones. And so uh, people start out with E being three, and there are certain attacks that, that can happen if E is very small, and people start using E being seven, and then kind of a couple of years ago, the kind of safe E was considered to be uh, two to the 16 plus one, um, and six by five point seven. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, you can choose a different E, but basically what happens with our say is your public E is N and E. You say, this is just any number that comes in, I'm gonna assume it was raised to the E power of one. All right. So we, we did uh, the non-modular scenario, and, and there's no security here, right? You can trivially decrypt it, trivially encrypt it. Let's talk about this. In order to, like I said, this operation happens in a slightly different modulo, right? This operation happened in mod P of N rather than mod N. Why is this the case? I don't know, that's some math, very heavy math thing. You can talk to Euler, who died a very, very, very long time ago, so you can't really talk to him. But uh, that totient function is Euler's totient function. So again, operations here take place mod uh, and, and the reason I hesitate drawing totient, I always draw it upside down by accident. Totient of n. And like I said, the totient of a prime is that prime minus one. Right, because what is the totient of uh, the sum of numbers of something that is not a prime? Turns out the totient of something that is not a prime. So the totient of, let's have another sidebar here. The totient of, let's see if we're getting better. Totient of something that is like A, B, C equals the totient of A times the totient of B times the totient of C and so on. And what is the totient of a prime? That prime minus one. So the totient of N is P minus one times q minus one. So totient of n is the totient of p times the totient of q, which is p minus one, q minus one. Okay, now, now, uh, I lost my train of thought. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so our, our 171 to the third, whereas this operation is all mod n down here, this in reality mathematically takes place and you don't have to worry about this in anything but us deriving RSA right now, it takes place in mod p minus one times q minus one, right? And we call this number m. So what's interesting about M? If we know P and Q, can we calculate M? Super easy. We, multiply, we take P, we subtract one. Can we do that in a computationally efficient way? Yeah. Absolutely. Q minus one, computationally efficient. Can we multiply two numbers together in a computationally efficient way? Absolutely, okay. So given P and Q, we can compute M. Given N, which is the product of P and Q, can we compute M? So who, who thinks yes? The person outside of the phone. <laughs> <laughs> They're wrong. I'm like, they have a quantum here. So it uh, turns out um, 
No. And this underpins RSA, at least, RSA style uh, public key crypto. Uh, turns out that if we have N, we cannot compute M uh, without a quantum computer. So suddenly we have our asymmetry. And again, what's so interesting about M, this takes place mod M, that's M, right? So you recall over here, we did this uh, one third. The reason that this works, of course, is this is equivalent to 171 to the third to the one third, which is equivalent to 171 to the three times one third, which is equivalent to 171 to the one, which is 171, right? Let's find something similar here. Let's hypothesize that there's a number D that when we raise this monster to, we'll do the same thing, negate everything and decrypt our, our, our stuff. So we have our 171 to the third mod n raised to the d, all this is mod n. And of course, we hope that this will end up being 171. How can we rewrite this? We have 171, sorry, uh, to the third times d, or really you want times one third mod n. Of course, writing it this way is a little, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, in inaccurate. What we actually have here is a to the e mod n. And we want to find a d such that a to the e times d mod n equals a mod n, right? And we want, this means that we want e to the d, e times d, to be one. But it's not just one, it's, this operation takes place under a modulo. What is that modulo? That modulo is m. And in other words, e, or rather D equals one over E, and here's the negative exponent, E to the negative one mod M. All right. Again, in order to compute D, we need to know M. And it turns out actually this computation is, is super easy. Uh, Euler also has an algorithm for this. Really Euler did all the heavy lifting and then the RSA guy just put it all together. Uh, but that's fine. I'm sure Euler doesn't mind because he's dead. Uh, so we have uh, a challenge to compute D, which is e to negative one mod m. You're going to have to trust me. There is a way to compute three to negative one mod m. This is, of course, not a uh, not one third. What are possible types of numbers in mod m in this field? They're integers. Uh, so it's going to be some other integer that, when multiplied by uh, uh, three, is going to uh, give us one. Let's actually. Compute that real quick. So our n is, or what was our p? 11. Q was 17. N was p times Q. Okay, here's our n. Um, e was 3. And so our, uh, our message was 171. And what we did was we did a to the power mod n, and that was 18, right? So 
what uh, might uh, D be for us? Uh, there's some API to compute this all automatically. Uh, should we do it live? Do you remember, Max? Oh, really? That's embarrassing. It's, it's, it, it's the, it's, uh, it's not here. It's the EGCD formula from Euler. Okay, we're gonna kind of do a, a bit of a YOLO thing here. So we have this. Okay. Uh, because I don't remember the actual call, we're just gonna brute force uh, the D, uh, rather the E, um, e to the negative one. So for every number that is possible under this modulo, whoops, what's going on? Oh, I forgot in. Okay, see Max, if you knew Python, you could have caught that. For every number that is valid under this modulo, we're going to see this number Gonna print i times, let's do d here. For every potential d times e mod n is, and here we do d or whatever, do result equals uh, d times e modulo n. And then if the result is one, you'll break. And we just computer until we hit 125 and turns out 125 times three modulo 187 is one. So we found the inverse of E modulo 187. Of course, we did this in the stupidest possible way. There's a, I, I forgot what uh, package, what module the EGCD is in, uh, is it in? GMP, I forgot. Again, most of programming is Googling stuff, so <laughs> I'm sure with a quick Google we can do it, but now we have it, we don't need to do it. So we have uh, 125 is our uh, inverse, but that's in modulo M, uh, modulo N. Was that correct? So let's see what happens when we try to use that. So this is our, our D. And what we said is if you have A to the E modulo N, and then we raise that to the D modulo N, it should give us our A back, right? Did it? No, not even close. It was some random garbage. William whatever would be very disappointed in us. Or well, as would the Euler. Why would Euler be disappointed in us? I couldn't find the right Python package, but the Euler probably didn't even know that there were snakes called Python, much less programming language. Um, we used the wrong modulo, guys. I used the wrong modulo, but I blame Max for not catching the mistake because he doesn't use Python. What did we say? All of this is modulo M because we're talking about operations up in the exponent. That's what Euler gave us, among a lot of other things. Maybe Euler invented coffee, probably not. So. But Euler definitely invented a lot of math that deals with uh, expo exponents. So, turns out we screwed up here. It's not mod n, it's mod m that you're looking at, right? Shame on us. Uh, we also didn't define M. What was M? The totient of N? P minus one times Q minus one. Now we can go. Boom. Okay, we have a new candidate, 107. Cool. 107 times three mod M, which is the modulo that uh, functions in the exponent. Uh, is one. So 107 is three to the negative one mod 
M. Now let's uh, try this again. Cool, huh? We took A, raised it to the E, modulated by M. We have a secret number D that only we know because only we know M. And we were able to use that to cancel out this exponentiation and recover our secret number. This is RSA at work. We just derived the entire basic crypto system of RSA. This is it. Cool. Who likes RSA? All right. Well, that's fine. <laughs> you can't win them all. All right. So much in a much drier way. This is RSA. We choose two distinct primes. We compute their product, and we choose an E. And I mean, they're this, this, there's a slight typo here. This is a little backwards. Uh, we compute. Uh, uh, the product and choose E, that becomes our public key. And then our secret key is basically uh, the M that only we know. And from that, we can derive D. There's a lot of relationships where given one, you can derive another. The important thing for any N and E, which is a public key, we can uh, derive by knowing the underlying primes, M and D, which is the secret key. Using N and E, we encrypt. Using N and D, we decrypt. Nice and simple. Anyone have any questions on RSA? Anyone a little confused about RSA? Oh, yes, what's up? No. So this is, everyone in RSA has their own public key and their own private key. And let's see, I think, yes, this is exactly it. So if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Alice needs Bob's public key. Why does Adam keep putting D as the private key? As a public key. Anyways, Alice needs Bob's public key, which is N and E. E is a, again, a common number, usually it's seven, six, five, five, three, seven, et cetera. And E is generally chosen to be large enough to be resistant to the tax. We'll talk about it in a sec. And uh, nice enough to be able to make these computations quickly. Alice needs Bob's public key to send Bob a message. And Bob's public key is that N and E. And Alice computes this A to the E mod N. And that's what she sends to Bob. And Bob receives that and decrypts it with his private key by calculating this and get A back. We can put an assert here so it's nice and official. Boom, it passed. All right. So, if Bob wants to send something to Alice, then Bob needs Alice's public key, okay? Um, so Alice can use M to the E mod N, that's the ciphertext she sends to Bob. Bob computes T to the D mod M. That's the original message back. In this case, you're using M uh, for the message. M is not the totient of N. Cool. So, any, uh, any questions on the encryption process and the decryption process? Hopefully, I've shown to you that this is a real thing and not just an abstract thing. Maybe with a little too 
far into the, the math on paper, but it's very cool once you get into like ways that it can go wrong, for example. All right. Some interesting facts about RSA. We already ran into this immediately. We can only send numbers that are less than n. Only encrypt numbers that are less than n. Right? So if you wanted to encrypt 732, you couldn't do it. And this was not up to the task. So we had to encrypt 171 instead. So how do we actually work with this to send arbitrary amounts of arbitrary data? Because obviously there are problems already. So I say, okay, one idea. We take every letter and you send it in a different manner, right? So if you want to send along, hello, of course, this uh, is a bunch of different letters. Each letter has an ASCII value, which we can get in Python with the ORD function. Capital H is 72, for example. And then we just iterate through and we encrypt each one. So what we can compute is a to the e mod, here, let's make this a little bigger. Did that help? Cool. Don't suffer in silence. Mod n for a in, we forgot, ord for a in message. And here is our encrypted message, right? And of course, we can also decrypt this message by raising it to the D. And so let's say encrypted. And then we can decrypt it, say, uh, every letter to the D mod N or A in encrypted. Here's the decrypted. There's that 72. Of course, you can make this a little nicer by turning this back into a character. Okay, there's hello, and then we can, of course, join it because Python is awesome and everyone doesn't use it. It's uh, shooting us out of the foot. Boom, we just implemented character by character encryption in RSA. So what, what's, are we done? Can we just use this? What might be a problem with this encryption scheme? That's one problem. Uh, a lot of a lot of That's another problem. Maintains the statistical properties of English for a long uh, big text. Because with this scheme, every time we encrypt the same letter, it'll be the same thing. You can see these two L's stand out immediately. Right? Someone that's very used to solving these little classical crypto. Uh, challenge problems would we'll take a look and probably recognize the low just by that repetition. Um, there's a third problem. Third problem is we have a very small space of plain text and ciphertext. So given an encrypted number 72, we can actually, and N and E, because those are public, we can actually iterate. For an entire byte range, if i to the e mod n is 72, because we're doing this byte by byte again, so we have very few options, break, we run this, i, why is i 30? Oh, sorry. 70, this isn't encrypted, this is encrypted. Okay, so this 87, 87, that's the two L's that are encrypted. 183 is actually what we're looking for, that's the H. So we're saying which letter encrypts to H? That letter is, or which letter encrypts to 183? That level, that letter is H. All right, because we have a very small space of potential input, potential plain text, we can iterate them all, encrypt them all, and see what matches. So in, in this case, we didn't have to decrypt to decrypt. We just encrypted a bunch of stuff and we saw what matched. So that's no good either. Um, this is actually a tough problem. People get it wrong a lot. Uh, what 
people do often is use RSA, of course, with a big, big enough N. And, and RSA nowadays, you know, small Ns, like when we're using are trivially factorable, of course, with mean force, you want a very large N. And then you typically use an initial RSA uh, protocol to come up with a symmetric key to then use in uh, later uh, communication. And that's nice and easy and works very well. And so basically you encrypt a key with your uh, RSA, you know, you're sending to Bob with Bob's public key, and then you encrypt your message with the key. There's still a lot of things you have to be careful about in terms of padding and so forth, but um, that's uh, generally how, uh, for example, when you do HTTPS for a lot, that's generally how. Any questions about RSA? Cool. I'll, I'll mention one more thing about RSA going off script in a very philosophical way. There's a lot of different attacks that people have developed against RSA. There's this, it's a whole cat and mouse game against any crypto system, right? One interesting attack against RSA is this. RSA depends on this operation, this encryption operation, kind of overflowing in some sense, and the modulo cutting it down more and more and more and more. That's what makes it impossible for that in classical uh, computing. I mean, not, I'm not saying it's absolutely impossible, but we definitely don't have the algorithms to do that, despite our ability to shoot uh, Teslas at foreign, uh, like, uh, extraplanetary bodies. Um, but we can't do this uh, modular uh, uh, log uh, discrete logarithm, you know, a logarithm under a module. We can exponentiate, but we can't go back. Uh, an interesting thing, and, and actually this requirement that this actually goes uh, over N is critical. Let me show you another failure mode of, uh, RSA, if we have a very um, large P and Q, so let's, let's have a large, I mean, this isn't prime, but that's fine, whatever. Here's our P, here's our Q, here's our N. N is now very large, almost certainly not prime, but for now, bear with us. You have, you're encrypting letter by letter, right, your E, what did we use for an E? We used three. And our letter is going to be H. Okay, 72. If we do A to the E mod N, we have this number, suspiciously small given our big N, because N didn't even come into play, 72 to the third power is too small for the modulus to matter. And if the modulus doesn't matter, then we're fucked. We can just take cube root of this guy. Um, how do I take a cube root? In, you don't know. How do I take a cube root? In <laughs> Someone take a cube root of this. Yeah. No, but one third is a decimal number. So let, let's try it. This is definitely not going to work. Well, okay, it gets close. Whatever. <laughs> if it wasn't for floating point insanity, or if if I actually knew how to use math and Python better. Or if you were using something like Maple or Mathematica, we could trivially decrypt this. Again, ignoring the module because the module is too freaking big, right? So even aside from the fact that letter by letter is very enforceable, you have a second problem, a third problem, in that um, it's if the result of your encryption is 
smaller than the modulo, fundamentally you're not even encrypting it. Okay, so then RSA has this whole thing that in order to use it properly, you have to use the proper pattern. So you have to make sure that you know if your modulo is some amount of bits, that you take up all, uh, all of those bits to be safe. Or you use a very large E. So I mentioned that E, is, a common E is uh, 2 to the 16 plus 1, 65537. If you do this now, Now that's bigger than n, right? Now that's encrypted. We still have the problem of having to do uh, possible input pointing. But you saw uh, that this was slower, although that was more to do with printing it than with computing it, but it was also a slower computation. Um, hence, bigger n's being uh, more rare. Um, one uh, final thing I'll say about RSA is this. We saw that, you know, if A to the E is too small to roll over N, it's no good, right? But it turns out that there's cases where even uh, having it roll over N is not good enough. So, Let's imagine that we have a, a very bad padding algorithm. We want to encrypt byte by byte, but uh, the way we do that is saying, okay, we can encrypt up to, I don't know, six, or uh, let's say eight bytes at a time, given the size of our modulus. So what we're going to do is, and we only want to do byte by byte, so what we're going to do is fill the rest with ones. Right, so then we have big numbers, okay? So we have big numbers, so we have some padding, uh, and let's uh, give it a, a letter, um, what's a letter we haven't used that's distinguishable? X, no, Z. Z is our padding, and fundamentally, our message now becomes Z plus our letter mod N, Right, but to the E's raw mod n equals C. Okay, so Z plus A, A is our message, our single letter, E and N, we you know, C is the, the result. These are pattern, that's not a two. Go, oh, cool. you picked a terrible letter. I'll cross my Z, and now it looks like shit, but at least it doesn't look like a two. Okay, so what if this E is small? Very small. What if the E is three? Well, it turns out if the E is three, we can uh, expand this into a polynomial. So let's actually pretend that E is two, so that this is easier. So this is now Z squared plus ZA two ZA plus A squared. Foil it up, and here's C. All, all this is mod n. Well, we, we know that. So now you have a system of equations here, and if you create a big system, or if you uh, encrypt a bunch of different A's, A1, and then you have the same thing, 2Z A2 plus A this C1 plus A2 squared equals C2, and so on and so forth. Now you have a system of equations. System of equations, and, and for each, each one, each equation, you don't know this A, but you know everything else, you know uh, Z, you know, let's say you, the pattern protocols are generally public. Uh, you know the C because that's what you were sent. And you can compute this because you know E because that's public as well and you know N. So you have a system of equations modulo N. And turns out that when you have a system of equations, even if these numbers are very big and make this generally unsolvable, you can do what is called a lattice reduction algorithm to go from these uh, numbers to smaller numbers, All right? So little tiny z squared plus two to a very little tiny z. Now it's just, I mean, these are different constants, of course. 
a2 plus a2 squared equals a little tiny c. And then you can get them small enough that the modulo doesn't matter and you can reverse all of it. That's uh, called the Coppersmith attack against RSA. It's an example of uh, one way RSA fails if your padding or your message is a specific root or format that allows this attack to work. For example. Okay, so that's Divi Hellman and RSA. Uh, I guess next week, uh, with Adam, we'll push back into uh, cryptographic hash function and so on. Cool. Any questions? I'll be here for a couple minutes. Good luck. Yeah, absolutely.